now we have Tim Connell from the City of Whittlesea. In putting all of these projects and putting these things together, there's little things that can go wrong. Um, and one of the most important things is we can do is understand project management about knowing what's going to possibly happen next and make sure the wrong thing doesn't happen. And this is very important to get our end result. And this is what Tim's here to talk to us about today. Thanks very much. Yeah, so uh, I work at Whittlesea Council, which is one of those um, growth area, peri-urban uh, settings that was mentioned in the last uh, presentation. One of the challenge that we, challenges that we face is uh, in managing the, uh, the impact of the urban growth priorities in our area in, in competition with the natural values that we're also trying to um, protect. I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about myself first, but um, I just want to I just want to footnote a disclaimer in this presentation that I live in I live in um, an area where I'm not I'm not uh, privy to reticulated services. Probably some of you are the same. So timber wood heating is my primary source of um, of heating for my my family house. So uh, I just want to put that little. Uh, disqualifier in there uh, so that I don't sound, t I, I just not want to sound too preachy about uh, the retention of habitat logs and um, but anyway in in the state of Victoria we manage <coughs> native vegetation um, under the Planning Environment Act 5217 of the Planning Environment Act I'm sure many of you are familiar with that particular clause uh, if, if not directly in land use decision making that some of you may have been involved in, uh, but also in the, I suppose in the implementation of some of the on-ground works that have resulted from tree clearing under that particular provision. So 5217, some of you would probably more better know as uh, net gain or uh, these days we, we know it as the permitted clearing regulations. But I am told that uh, there is Yet another review underway by the state government, and um, fingers crossed, hopefully some of the permitted clearing regulations may be looking at shifting a little bit back towards the uh, the, the precautionary principles that that the original 5217 uh, net gain provisions or the framework were based on, and those provisions around avoidance and minimisation, which presently. The, the application of that particular, that particular provision in the planning scheme tends to, tends to fast track towards the idea of offsetting the loss of vegetation, which I know a lot of people in the ecological area find, um, like, well, quite frankly, a lot of them find quite an abhorrent uh, principle that you can take a, an ecological feature like one of these several hundred year old river red gums and you can offset it through sheer sheer numbers of tube stock planting. So in the city of Whittlesea, we spend a lot of time dealing with our land use decisions, decisions on the retention or approving the removal of native vegetation uh, in line with that particular state provision. But we also, at a local level, we have a, we have a, a local planning policy called the River Redgum policy. Can I just have a show of hands of anyone here who's ever worked in or for the city of Whittlesea professionally? So, and um, with, with those people that just put, put your hand up, how many, of, um, the, uh, how many of you were involved in the removal of river red gums in the city of Whittlesea? Yeah. Okay. I just, I wanted to ask that question because um, I think it's really, it's really, it's really important to just clarify that the River Red Gum Protection Policy in the City of Whittlesea. It's a fairly unique piece of local planning policy, but it, it's, it, it's definitely not a, uh, a save-all or a, um, a stop-all to the <coughs> removal of River Red Gums. It's, in practice, I suppose, it's, you might call it an aspirational policy. It doesn't exactly qualify or document how we should be remove, how we should be protecting or removing river red gum trees. It, it really just sets some targets about how um, about what the values of these river red gum trees are, and um, and also we should not we should not only be 
retaining the old significant trees, but we should also be looking to try and protect and retain many of the areas of young and regenerating stands of river red gum. So I've got a lot of photos here, so bear with me. I hope I don't give you all photo fatigue. Um, this is a river red gum tree out at our growling, growling frog golf course in Donnybrook Road, Yanyan. The, Don the growling frog golf course was, was created in about 2002, 2003, and it was a golf course designed to work around the existing landscape feature. So we didn't remove any river red gums through the process of the creation of the golf course. The whole 18 holes were planned around retention of all of those. And through the last 12 years or so, we've worked on a pretty active, an active process of embellishment of the site. Uh, you can see in the foreground here, we have a lot of uh, sort of sedgy, semi-aquatic vegetation. And that's been an, another really important feature of the Growling Frog Golf Course is embellishment of the trees, which once upon a time were purely in a, an agricultural and a, and a paddock setting, converting it to a much more natural setting where we're getting uh, biofiltration ponds and wetlands throughout the site, which create a lot, much, much greater <coughs> habitat opportunities for the fauna on site. So that particular red gum there had very large hollows in it, but our fauna monitoring over the years has shown us that it's, it's some of these really kooky branch formations that are acting as, uh, that are acting as the, the, the habitat and the homes of our, of our greatest faunal diversity. I should clarify here that I'm, I'm actually a botanist, I'm not a, a zoologist, so um, I rely very much on ecological consultants to provide the, the advice at uh, the City of Whittlesea. My role, at, I, I, sorry I jumped ahead before, I didn't really explain, my role in, in Whittlesea Council is around assessing a lot of the ecological advice that comes in from the development industry and the planning consultancies representing that industry. But these, these sorts of chimney hollows that we have uh, at, this, at the golf course there are the kinds of sites where we've done a lot of our, our micro bat monitoring. And a uh, terrible photo there, my apologies, but the sort of vertical chimney type hollows that um, our micro bats are living in are just some of those habitat structures and features that we find across these more naturalised bushland sites at Whittlesea. Um, the bark, the sheeting barks that are associated with these large old ancient red gums, they contribute not only to the habitat in situ on the, on the trees themselves, but also to that, that ground layer and that leaf layer. Within the, the Growling Frog Golf Course, and I, I am going to look at other sites, so just this is one of our, um, it's one of our Jewel in the Crown open space reserves at Whittlesea. Within, within the golf course, we, we have to manage our river red gums, not only for their conservation values, but for the interaction with the golfing community on site. So um, this was a river red gum that back in 2000 and six got struck by lightning and we're faced with two, op two, two options then, the removal or just the pollarding back of that tree. And we initially had an idea of, of pollarding the tree back and enhancing it with river red guns but when the pollarding took place it was, it was quite evident straight away that there were ample natural hollows formed in the tree so the decision was made to just leave that structure in place. Uh, there was a lot of work invested, I suppose, if I go back there, uh, into not only exclusion planting and trying to remove the risk factors through a landscaping approach, but also in the debarking. We, we had a couple of runs at um, debarking this tree after the fact. Um, it spent about uh, six, to nine mark, six to nine months of shedding, shedding bark on golfers. So 
what I really wanted to talk to in complementing today's focus was not so much about those standing hollows because people like James are obviously the experts at that. But I wanted to look at, take a more of a practitioner's approach at looking at some of the benefits of how we retain the logs and the coarse woody, the coarse woody debris that comes out of the approved tree removals at the City of Whittlesea. The Fauna and Flora Guarantee Act in Victoria is the piece of legislation that, that dictates the, the management of, of flora and fauna in a, in a public land setting. So pr uh, primarily Crown land is where it applies to. But the Flora and Fauna Guarantee Act dictates that management initially by identifying a, a whole series of threatening processes. So we saw before things like foxes and bees and so forth. But one of the key threatening processes that it does identify is the removal of uh, structures, ground structures, so logs, rocks, from natural habitats and environments. And so through the removal of those particular structures, we lose some of these benefits associated with logs and rock structures in a natural setting. So the, the microclimates of invertebrates, the physical habitat for macrofauna, and also the creation of um, microclimates for, for particular flora species as well. So in a natural setting, when trees like this fall, we manage those particular pieces of land by just allowing them to fall and over a very slow, prolonged period, break down and, and be consumed back into the, you know, the drip zone of that particular tree. But if, if, this was, if this was in more of an urban parkland setting, what, what would we be doing here? Moving it, trip hazard. Um, but actually, why, why, would we, why would we be moving us? I heard trip hazard, but why else? Complaints. Unsightly aesthetics. Pardon? So you can get lawn maintenance machinery. Yeah, all of those. There's maintenance. A lot, of, a lot of the times I think it's about aesthetics in that particular urban setting. So in the urban parkland setting, a lot of people, they just don't like the look of this particular parkland presentation. So local governments generally respond by chopping up, clearing up. Uh, actually, another, I, I, I like to think that another reason, um, I mean, we said trip hazards, but I think that particularly in peri-urban growth areas, I think one of the reasons we tidy these up is because we take that risk management approach that if we don't do it, the general public will probably get in there and the woodhawks will come along and they'll tidy up for us. So we, we, we're taking that precautionary approach that someone doesn't, someone who doesn't know what they're doing doesn't get in there with a chainsaw and hurt themselves on our land. Um, in, in managed bushland, and this is still at the same side of the Growling Frog Golf Course, we're taking a, I suppose, a more proactive approach to, to those sort of log falls. And, and when they're on the golf course, we, we, we do chop up those logs because golfers don't like having to pick their <coughs> golf balls out of the fallen logs. But in reusing that material, we're trying to take a bit more of a proactive approach about how we reuse, reuse that log material on site, not only to create discrete areas of habitat, but also to create strategic links between existing remnant vegetation and, and habitat features. So in the distance here, you can see a lot of young trees that have been revegetated along the Barbers Creek there. I'll show you that in, a, in another slide in a minute too. But, but we're trying to link up a farm dam to that <coughs> waterway through a series of different islands of cover for ground fauna. And that in turn, as I mentioned, provides that microclimate for almost naturally embellishing the habitat. So here we can see self-colonisation of salt bushes and things that have, have um, naturally germinated in these piles of logs. So they, they then create that other component of habitat. We've not only got cover, but now we've also got food sources there for some of our ground reptiles too. Um, we're, we're obviously limited by the number of logs that we can, can use and take. We generally, we don't go chop down 
go chopping down trees to create more ground fauna. Um, so we do tend to use a lot, uh, quite a lot of different artificial habitat, whether it is uh, tin or concrete pavers or even roof tiles. The reuse of logs has, has been a very common practice in urban settings around constructed wetlands. So water sensitive urban design has tended to use reclaimed logs from approved tree removals as edging features, um, as also as creating these sort of artificial perching sites or natural artificial perching sites for things like cormorants, darters, um, in, in more coastal areas. But we, we do this opportunistically at the city of Whittlesea. Um, water sensitive urban design is it's almost, I mean, it is the norm now in growth areas. So we are applying this as, I suppose, business as usual. In biofiltration swales as well, these logs are reintroduced to create that diversity of habitat, again, again for birds, for basking sites, for reptiles. So the introduction of all this ground habitat across our reserve system at the city of Whittlesea, we, we know that, I suppose we know that it's, it's, we're not doing it from an experimental perspective. We're doing it because we know that others have, have done that work. We know that it's, you, you have the habitat or you don't have the habitat. You have the fauna or you don't have the fauna. So, what we're trying to do in our, in our management processes is undertake monitoring that will just inform adaptive management of those particular sites. So we've been fortunate enough in the last seven or eight years to have worked with Peter Homan, who's a, a, a fauna specialist, works for himself, works for RMIT. His specialty is on uh, reptiles of Southeast Australia. And so through his work of monitoring, monitoring ground fauna, the artificial habitat, the reintroduction of logs in wetlands, in bushland, we've been able to document 16 species of reptile and herbivora, so frogs, um, utilising these artificial habitat sites. Um, that work's been published in uh, in research reports in the Victorian Field Naturalist magazine. So looking at the introduction of, of fencing posts and artificial pavers for creating homes for these little fellas. So I know that as arborists you don't have as much to do with rocks as you do with logs, but we've taken this proactive approach on not only the reintroduction of logs but on a almost on a broad landscape scale the re-rocking of many of these areas of, of of open space reserve particularly where they're important linear corridors so this is the Barbers Creek in Yanyang it it's one of the important tributaries of the Pliny River and we undertook some revegetation of this waterway back in 2005 but prior to doing that um, it, was, it was a site, it was identified as a, an important linking tributary for the growling grass frog. So I mentioned that we have recorded 16 species of um, frogs and lizards in these reserves. Um, two of them are, are, are listed species, one being the tussock skink um, and the other being the nationally endangered growling grass frog. So this corridor was planted in 2000 and Six, we utilised a lot of community involvement, and oh, what's that? That's about nine years on now. So we've now got revegetation areas that have all of these different layers and levels of structural habitat, and it provides a much more diverse and rich opportunity for for our fauna at the at the site. <coughs> Um, so these sites are 
they're pretty easy to manage. These are isolated sites, like I mentioned, the Growling Frog Golf Course. So they're generally closed to the public. These are sites that the very select user groups get in there. We have about 40 or 50 hectares of that site, which is set aside exclusively for conservation purposes. The challenge we have in replicating that kind of a land management approach is where we start moving into these growth area interfaces. So again, trying to implement that idea of complementary habitat in the wetland environment. So Melbourne, water, um, water sensitive urban design sites, treatment sites. We're getting developers more and more to place those logs on the, on the waterway corridors, but sometimes what gets placed there through the civil works construction period and what ends up there in a, in a conservation reserve perhaps two years later can be very different. So this is, the sort of, um, this is the sort of habitat log structure that we often end up at the end of the equation. So that, it's questionable how useful that is as a habitat structure. I mean, this is, this is a site here, you can see in the background, urban development, you can see a Yarra Valley water pump station. We've got this constructed Melbourne water wetland drainage system, and we've got a log placed in the, on the left-hand side of the screen there. Um, we've got a, an egret perched up on there, which was quite, uh, quite on cue when I took that photo. But the difficulty is that the temptation now in that peri-urban setting, uh, peri setting with civil works contractors, with heavy machinery, with tradespeople, with um, chainsaws, with you know, every tool under the sun decked out in their, in their work utes and, and uh, trailers, to retain this from that construction phase through into um, the urbanisation is a real challenge, and we've we we have um, we have to date really struggled with that quite a bit. Tree removal in the city of Whittlesea is guided by some pretty strict conditions on our planning permits. So to remove a to remove a river red gum tree in Whittlesea requires a planning permit, as and I, I mentioned, fifty two seventeen of the Planning Environment Act requires that approach of um, avoidance and, and offsets. But the conditions in Whittlesea require verification, they require marking of that, that tree so that we ensure that uh, when the tree is actually, you know, a saw is being taken to that tree or an excavator to, to bowl that tree over, that it is the right tree and it isn't um, accidentally different to the approved plan. Zoological inspection is a requirement, and material reuse is also an occasional requirement. But the protection of those trees that we are keeping on site, the standard trees, um, is guided very prescriptively in Whittlesea by our tree protection zone standards. So some of you working in, who have had that experience of working in Whittlesea may have encountered these recently. They were, they were knocked up a few years ago. They're more, I suppose, for the, uh, the benefit of the, the landscape architect, the civil construct construction workers, and also for um, those people doing the landscape detail as well. The TPZ standard is black and white. It's easily written up onto a planning permit condition. And it's, the details in it are prescriptive and really black and white. They can't, they can't really be misunderstood and they allow themselves, uh, they, they provide leverage back to the local government to be able to enforce a breach of the planning permit condition. The delivery of permit conditions that require placing of logs, reuse of habitat materials is really not as clear cut as our tree protection zone standards. So our our current practices are very opportunistic and they depend on things like proximity to a, a conservation reserve or a water feature. So at the moment, this is the standard um, permit condition for reuse in the city of Whittlesea. The standard permit condition is really 
leaning towards the reuse of the material simply and purely as mulch. So this, this is actually a site of um, illegal vegetation clearing, but it's the only one I could find of really large um, piles of river red gum mulch here. But we've got to question the value of that over the value of those particular trees being reused. What, what is its value to the fauna? We have come up with occasionally the use of an alternative planning permit condition that has this provision in there that must be relocated in accordance with any direction. So it, it's, it again, it leaves, leaves the reuse open to interpretation, to um, a very subject opportunism, and also provides, in practice, a really strong opportunity for the development community to getting out of delivering on this particular condition. So in the past we have had um, red gum materials reused in things like seating, sculptures used in neighbourhood parks. Um, We've had some of the material milled up in the past, and that's been reused. We had a um, we had a Green Corps team about six years ago uh, construct a bird hide here, which is overlooking one of our our wetlands out at the Growling Frog Golf Course. So it's very opportunistic. It's not really dictated or or guided by uh, a particular policy or standard. The restrictions to our reuse are always based on cost. Um, so the alternative to having, an, having a, a tree on site chopped up for firewood, having it relocated, having it milled, having it placed with um, crane trucks, particularly if we're trying to relocate things into um, you know, existing waterways and water bodies that have already been constructed, there's a lot of limitations around, uh, around that. Um, this is an example here of where, uh, in an urban development site in Epping North, the Summer Hill Estate, we're out doing an inspection of this central reserve here that was being constructed. It's, it's actually it's a, a Stony Knoll reserve with cu cultural heritage significance that was being protected for, um, for, for those particular features. But when we were out there, we happened to notice that just... I've got a laser pointer. No, I don't have a laser pointer, but... Um, just at the bottom of this slide in the adjacent paddock there was a stockpile of logs <coughs> sitting in that paddock no, no wasn't no um, other adjacent trees no, no continuous uh, vegetation reserves nearby and so we got in touch with that property owner who also happened to be a developer and asked them what, what are these logs doing here have they been you know, they're part of approved removals. And we ended up going back through a, se a sequence of aerial photos and found that these, these logs had been sitting in the paddock since, um, since the late 1980s. And um, they'd been completely ignored by the surrounding development community. But this is a site that is um, due to be uh, developed much in the same way as the surrounding urban development. So again, opportunistically, took it upon ourselves to claim these logs and reuse them in, in the habitat, um, in, in our habitat relocation programs. But again, the, the costs involved in uh, transport, in relocation, one of the biggest challenges that we had in this particular exercise was around timing. So being able to move these on-site, off-site, getting them into wetlands, um, some of the wetlands that we wanted to move these to were at the Growling Frog Golf Course again. Uh, so being able to access the site through winter months was a real challenge too. Another big challenge that we've found with this idea and this process of being able to reclaim logs, as I mentioned, the timing isn't always ideal. So we have to find areas to stockpile those logs. So we are quite fortunate to have a number of sites, a number of large regional reserves in the city of Whittlesea 
that lend themselves to these kind of stockpiling activities. So again, the growling frog golf course, but we've recently inherited a, a farm, a 105 hectare farm uh, in South Morang that forms part of the Quarry Hills Regional Park. So we've got a caretaker living on site within that property. And the, the footprint of the, for, the former farmers agricultural activity, soil mixing, um, lent itself to for us to be able to create a bit of a stockpile site. So you can see iron bark logs and uh, rocks in the background. We've got cypress logs. So not every local government authority would have this kind of facility. Um, and if they had this kind of facility, would it be a secure facility where they'd feel comfortable leaving um, you know, high value timber products? In revegetation, the value of re-rocking and re-logging conservation reserves is, is sometimes underestimated. Recently, we've gone through a process of placing covenants on seven of our conservation reserves. So we've gone through a, a bush broker process where we've put a Section 69 agreement on those pieces of land. And what that does is that provides us with um, tradable vegetation credits for the um, for offsets, not only for our own operations, but also for trading in a broader vegetation market across Victoria, or I should clarify, across the Port Phillip catchment. The, um, the addition of habitat logs in the habitat hectare scoring system adds around about two to five points in the, in the habitat hectare score. So that's, that's a potential gain of two to five percent improvement in the revegetation project. So uh, habitat hectare score, you know, it's scored out of 100 based on the particular vegetation EVC. Uh, and it looks at things like proximity to other vegetation. It looks at the presence of trees, understory, ground story. It looks at... Um, yeah, structural elements like this as well. It looks at the presence of weeds um, and other threatening processes. So anything we can do to try and create incentives for re-rocking, re re-logging our revegetation projects is a bonus. Because if you think about the, the revegetation and offsets as a tradable commodity, the increase of a two to five percent uh, gain in our score also directly translates into a two to five percent gain in the value of that tradable commodity. So presently, um, yeah, the the vegetation gains are being traded on the uh, through the Victorian Credit Trade Register at about um, anywhere from a hundred to four or five hundred thousand dollars per biodiversity equivalence unit. And if you don't know what that is, a biodiversity equivalence unit, you're probably the majority in this room. We, um, we, yeah, we're still coming to terms with exactly how um, BEUs are traded. It, it used to be that you know, trees were trees, you, you clear trees, you offset trees, you had this idea of habitat hectares, you clear a quality or a quantity of vegetation, you apply a, a similar offset amount of quality and quantity. But biodiversity equivalence units looks at an embedded score on particular threatened species presence. So, um, the short of it is diversifying our, our, the structures by introducing these elements is a good thing. So this is an example at one of our landfill sites uh, adjacent to the Mary Creek in Epping where we've undertaken a, a really extensive range of revegetation works and some of that work has included re-rocking, re-logging in between our, our plantings. So these are, you know, these are sort of, you might call them fake stony knoll type revegetation areas. We're revegetating a number of ephemeral wetlands and biofiltration wetlands that catch water runoff from our, our capped landfill sites. So they've got a very functional um, role from a, a water management perspective, but structurally from a, a fauna habitat perspective, 
we've added a lot of a lot of benefit here. And the monitoring works here hasn't so much found growling grass frogs in these ephemeral wetlands, but we found I think we've found four other frog species in these ephemerals. But what we are doing is that we've got these um, quarry sites on our landfill, and these quarry sites are actually known growling grass frog breeding spots. So once upon a time, as a functional landfill, the growling, uh, that quarry was flooded, so water was pumped from the Mary Creek into the quarry, and that water was used through summertime for um, dust suppression. So over about a 30 or 40 year period of the landfill operating like this, it became a hot spot for growling grass frog breeding. Um, when the landfill shut down, the pumping operations ceased to take place and then the growling grass frog population completely crashed. So we, in conjunction with the Melbourne wholesale market um, across the road, implemented this habitat improvement program at this site, which placed a, a non-title agreement. So again, it's a section 69 agreement under the Conservation and Forest Land Act between, so it's between the city of Whittlesea and the state government saying that we'll We'll never clear this, we'll make an in, a, a perpetual commitment to manage this as growling grass frog habitat. We'll pump water out of the creek every year, we'll flood it for breeding, and we'll also, managing the threat, we'll also manage the threatening processes. So the threatening processes, again, this photo is taken from a capped landfill site. So we're managing sedimentation, which potentially will fill up that, that quarry site. And so, through the biofiltration uh, swales and ponds that we've created, you can see we've invested in the relocation of logs, the relocation of rocks that will not only assist in the water management, but it will provide dispersal opportunities for that threatened species. Um, this is revegetation getting onto the, uh, well, so it was a planting day we did. National Tree Day 2005 at Quarry Hills. So when we first started doing this, the community were very keen to plant trees. They just want to plant trees and smash them in and plant as many trees as they can get in. Um, we're recreating a lot of hilltop woodlands here, Granitic Hill, uh, sorry, Granitic Hills, EBC. So red stringy barks, she oaks, those kinds of species are, are primarily used in this, uh, this revegetation project. But 10 years on, um, as often happens in these sorts of revegetation uh, areas, and, and to accelerate the growth and release, I suppose, the, the growth potential of these trees, we've gone through and done an ecological thinning process. And so that's helped, that's helped to create yeah, greater light in these reveg areas, but it's also, as you can see here, placed a lot more of that ground habitat on the ground, which will break down, create those microclimates you can see that these areas are, those dark shapes just sort of up in the, uh, the sort of the, the grassy horizon there, those dark shapes are eastern grey kangaroos, so we're creating good shelter habitat for them who have all been dispersed from the residential growth areas. In another revegetation project or a landscaping project over in Doreen at Mitchell's Run, We've tried to reuse habitat logs, not only for their habitat purpose, but also to provide um, visual, visual indicators to people using adjacent land that this is a conservation reserve. So you can see here that in the top left hand side that there's a playground, we've got an, an active, or sorry, a passive kick around grassy area. We've got some landscape planting that define a conservation zone from um, a recreational zone. And so we've used, along parallel to the planting perimeter there, we've used the placement of logs as that visual cue. Uh, because, yeah, it's, they're sort of, well, to some extent, it, it'd be nice to have children engaging with these sorts of areas and, you know, getting more actively involved in nature play. But I think that in reality, what we're finding is that um, those visual cues are creating for a lot of, a, a lot of young people keep out. As we continue to grow and um, I, um, I, I can confirm that we are continuing to grow, 
Um, Whittlesea is, Whittlesea along with Hume, Gardenia, Wyndham, Melton, are some of the growth area municipalities that presently are being investigated and developed as part of the Melbourne Strategic Assessment and, and the, the growth area, urban growth boundary revision that occurred in 2010. But that's being managed now much more in a larger strategic perspective through the precinct structure plan process, which is the PSPs. Um, the PSPs in the growth areas are looking at trying to create more functionally, uh, sorry, more, more functional large conservation reserve areas as opposed to a scattergun approach. So in theory that's a good thing, but it does actually come at the expense of a lot of scattered tree removal. Well, the Willert Precinct Structure Plan is kind of our next growth area in Whittlesea, so beyond Epping North, heading into Alert. It's a precinct structure plan area that has around about 3,000 large river red gums. Under the current state government's um, approach to the biodiversity conservation strategy in this area, it really only protects about 500 of those river red gums. So part of our land use planning and our strategic planning team involvement with the, the, the precinct structure plan is trying to work out ways that we can capture as many of these trees as possible in the, um, in the, the streetscapes, in the neighbourhood parks, in the pocket parks. But as far back as we can push, there's, there's definitely going to be lots and lots of large trees removed and, uh, and probably in the, you know, in, the, in the quantum of hundreds. So the precinct structure plan looks at defining roles and responsibilities through guidelines um, and conditions and, and they're really the type of things that will uh, inform how each property developer proposes to roll out their subdivision. One of the challenges that we're having at the moment is getting this idea of habitat reset, re, reuse into the precinct structure plan guidelines and conditions. So in an area like Willard or Donnybrook where there is a, a really large number of trees proposed, proposing to be reused, we're actually trying to get similar to standards to what we've got with our tree protection, um, our tree protection standard landscape details into the guidelines so that it does have that black and white non-negotiable chop this tree down, must reuse it in a conservation reserve or a wetland reserve or yeah, relocate it into a, 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 a regional parkland of some sort. So they're the challenge that, challenges that we face in that peri-urban space moving forward. Um, and yeah, it's, it's a standard that I suppose we're really in a draft format at present but um, forums like this help us to gather the evidence on why we should be um, trying to reuse that, our structures. That's my last slide. Um, thank you very much for having me. This, this final slide I'll leave you with is, um, it's actually from the Plenty Gorge Parklands in right on the boundary of one of our municipal conservation reserves. It's an Aboriginal scar tree. Um, we know it's an Aboriginal scar tree because it was created in 2012. Um, so I, I just I want to draw the analogy here on our, we, we've, today is obviously all about cult, uh, natural heritage protection and embellishment. There's a very similar movement happening at the moment in Melbourne around uh, the continuation of cultural heritage practice. And this is one such example then back in 2012 when um, the Wurundjeri elders bought out, um, they bought out uh, a lot of young members of the community to come and take part in this to, uh, to just to demonstrate continuation of cultural heritage practices. So that's me. Okay, thanks. Um, BPIO labelled bottle oh, of uh, red. Um, do we have a quick question? We've probably got one or two really quick questions. And you can pick on me as a growth area person. Mr. Stevens. Uh, we looked at the work up in the new estates in Dorian and 
And um, a lot of the tree protection on the red gum seems to have good intention, but mm. really poor execution. And some of that execution has obviously come down to what's been approved yep. by, by planning departments. The other thing I sort of noticed as well is they, with their street trees and their park trees, they, they're planting shitloads, which is brilliant, but they don't seem to be planting malvulences. And in fact, some of their clauses say they have to remove malvulences seedlings from the reserves that basically come up naturally. Um, it, it is horses for courses. I mean, the, it's, it, it's an oh and issue in terms of uh, river red gums in, in streetscapes, I suppose. It's, they're, they're, not, they're, not a, they're not considered a, um, a great tree for that purpose. Um, do, do you disagree? Park benches <laughs> yeah, oh, look, we, we, we are going through a, a, you know, a retrofit process. There's a lot of places like Mernda Villages Estate, for example, where you know, we've created a, um, a dog-off-leash park um, that has, I think, two seats under river root guns. Look, it, it, it evolves over time. I think we're getting better and smarter at these. We're, we're putting a process in every, every year of, of that type of... Like I showed you that example under the, the, the river red gum that was struck by lightning. Exclusion planting, that's, that's kind of our preferred approach now to a lot of these isolated river red gums. Um, the, the mulching inside the, the canopy zone obviously has that benefit. Um, the compromising of tree protection zones is is nine times out of ten the left hand and the right hand not talking to each other. So our civil engineering people giving approval for services or construction of footpaths, contrary to the advice of um, our <coughs> parks and open space landscape development team. And look, that's the challenge. Strategic planners, statutory planners, they get a subdivision application, they throw out you know, requests for comments, they get back six different competing sets of comments and conditions and they have to do the best job that they can to make everyone a little bit unhappy but to try and get the best overall community outcome. Um, yeah, so, I mean, we, we've, we've done things like um, develop standards for, you know, floating, floating footpaths as, as a preferred uh, harm minimisation response to footpaths through encroaching TPZ areas. Okay, I know you've got a question, Matthew. I'm going to have to ask you to ask it um, in the lunch break, the same as everyone else. We're just starting to fall a little bit behind time, and I don't want to get too far Sorry. behind time. That's okay? Sorry for Brandon. That's, um, now, we've, we've got a little bit of time to play with, but we can't fall too far. So, um, once again, thank you.